talked that behold there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces, tore them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, where is Yahweh, God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Please incline your faces toward heaven briefly. Father, thank you. And thank you for our gathering today. We bless you for the praise and worship that has ascended before you, and we pray that you receive it as an offering of sweet smelling savor unto you. Honor the singing, honor the praise, honor the worship now by speaking to our hearts a word. We need to hear from you. We need a word from you. We don't want to hear from high. We want to hear from heaven. And so we ask that you take this word now and transform it into necessary elements for us so that we can digest. Make it seed to sowers, bread to eaters, milk to babes, meat to strong men and women. And I ask that this vessel, clarity in thought, precision of speech, strength to declare the truth of your word as well as the word of your truth, but most of all, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength, my firm and impenetrable rock, and my redeemer. I ask these favors in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated, and as you take your seats, can we give the Lord a clap of offering? read the whole text in your hearing again, but I will read the last two verses of the text, verse 13 and verse 14. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is Yahweh, God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither. And Elisha went over. Took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, where is Yahweh, the God of Elijah? This afternoon, I want to take Elisha's question and use it for a subject. Breaking the rules of homiletics today, they tell us you should never 
use a subject that is an interrogative question. But there are no professors in the room. And if y'all don't tell them, I should be okay. The subject today is where is the God of Elijah? Where is the God of Elijah? The time of our text is a lot like the times in which we live. It was a time when willful and capricious leaders were in charge. And religious leaders were often more concerned about their own comfort and prosperity than they were about the people that they were supposed to be serving. Israel had become a religiously pluralistic society where virtually anything was tolerated, even celebrated under the guise of religion. Fasten your seatbelts today, it might be a little bumpy. While so many of us morally conservative pastors today struggle to maintain our witness, especially in the wake of things like the preachers of LA, preachers of Detroit, preachers' daughters. Was that what it was called? The preachers' daughters or something like that? Um, all of which cast folk like me in a bad light. Because even the good ones who were on those shows were mired by the scoundrels. Y'all remember that word, right? Scoundrels. Who did what they did under the guise of pastoring. So there are those of us who are trying to do right. Trying to live right. How many preachers in here trying to live right? It's because not only did they tarnish me, they tarnished you. Where are all the preachers? I saw a few hands up, or maybe not all the preachers are trying to live right. <laughs> maybe you hold now for preachers of date now. <laughs> that would be on somebody's cable access. <laughs> okay. Uh, Y'all can tell I'm tired. But while so many of us morally conservative pastors today struggle to maintain our witness in the days of the Elijah, there were temples in which prostitution of both genders, exploitation of both genders was encouraged for religious purposes. People had departed from the faith and teachings of Israel and were turning wholesale to the religions of Baal and Asherah. It was a time of spiritual decline for Israel. As a nation, it had fallen spiritually. But it was during that time that seemingly out of nowhere, Elijah came to stand up for the name of God and the religion of Israel. Elijah, whose name meant my God is Yahweh, was a man of great contrast fierce light and deep shadows. One might even go as far as to say that in his 
prophetic capacity, Elijah had no personality of his own, but was in effect the medium of the word of Yahweh. In some ways, he was as much message as he was messenger. But he made a tremendous impact on Israel. Through his words and through the signs and wonders that followed him, revival broke out in Israel. Many of the common folk turned their faces back to the God of Israel. Now by the time of our text, Elijah's season of impact had concluded. His ministry had come to an end, but he had already prepared for the continuation of the revival that he had started. Eight years prior to his departure, Elijah threw his mantle upon a young man by the name of Elisha signifying that he was chosen to be Elijah's successor. Elijah served and studied under Elijah for approximately eight years. While Elisha poured water on the hands of Elijah, Elijah poured wisdom and knowledge into the heart of Elisha. Whether we believe it or not, serving a man or woman of God prepares us for ministry in ways that are immeasurable. Teaches us things that no college or seminary can pour into us. What so many take for granted is in fact priceless. And while the task we servants are given may seem mundane, they are actually a setup for things that are miraculous and magnificent. I think back to my own ministerial career, friends that I had back then, and I still have them, used to laugh at me at the conventions, carrying big boxes of copies, running here and there while they were churching, I was working. <laughs> while they were hanging out on, uh, in the restaurants and whatnot after service at the conventions, I couldn't hang with them because I had a slave driver right. for a boss. Right. I'm talking about my wife's father. All right. I get calls at two in the morning. Um, I need you to have some copies ready by eight in the morning. Okay, Bishop, how many? 300. <laughs> leave my bed and run to the nearest Kinko and sit there all night and wait for copies. All right. How very curious though, I am now doing the job that he hey. used to do. Hey. So what you think is wax on, wax off, might really be pouring something into you that you need to defend the faith. Well, the day had arrived and Elijah was about to receive a reward that is almost unparalleled. Like Enoch before him, he would be translated that he should not see death. I'm not going to tell the whole story, but I am going to tell a portion of it. And as the time uh, of Elijah, Elijah's ascension drew near, he told Elisha 
that he needed to take a journey from Gilgal to Bethel and that he should remain there. But Elisha assured him that he would accompany him. And that scenario played out twice more at Jericho and then again at the Jordan River. Stay with me, y'all. I'm going somewhere. I found it interesting that at each stop, Bethel, Jericho, and Jordan, there was a school of the prophets. I also found it interesting that they all knew what was about to happen. I think there's some secrets that God doesn't keep. Amen. But that's for another time. Perhaps Elijah went to all of these places to say goodbye to those who had followed, supported, and even assisted in his prophetic ministry to Israel. For a moment, though, I want us to train our attention to the last place that Elijah went because it was there that this story gets interesting. They came to the lip of the Jordan River. Elijah took off his cloak, his mantle as the King James Version calls it. He wrapped it up and then he hit the water with it. When he did, the water separated and they traversed a dry riverbed. Notice I said that. I'm referring to Elijah and Elisha. While there were 50 other prophets gathered there to watch what would happen, only Elijah and Elisha went across the Jordan. In all places, Elisha remained faithfully by his side. And as a reward for his faithfulness to his master and to his master's ministry, Elijah asked him what he could do for him before he would be translated. Elisha was not hesitant. He was not timid in his request. He was bold. He said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Can I talk about that for a minute? Thank you very much. I was going to anyway, but it's nice to have your consent. Now, in the theological community, there is some debate about exactly what Elisha's request was. There are those who reference that the, uh, uh, the other sons of the prophets that were at Bethel, Jericho, and Jordan, they teach, and with some merit, I have to say, that Elijah was their master prophet All right. from whom they learned and that would make them spiritual sons. Are y'all with me? Amen. And if that is the case, Elisha would be the first son among them. Uh -huh. Certainly first in rank, if not first in order. Those who fully embrace this notion say that Elisha was exercising what is called the right of primogenitor. That's the right of the firstborn son in the household. Well, what is that right? The right of primogenitor states that the firstborn son receives twice as much of the father's inheritance as his other siblings. Uh -huh. So they teach that Elisha was simply asking for twice as much of Elijah's prophetic unction as what the other sons of the prophets would receive. Amen. Elijah's reply to him was basically, you have asked a difficult thing, but if you see me, when I'm taken up away from you, you'll get what you asked for. But that was also 
a difficult thing. Can I talk about it? Amen. I say it was difficult because as they continued walking and talking, a fiery chariot yeah. pulled by fiery horses yeah. appeared Glory. and actually drove up between Elijah and Elisha. Now that's something you don't see every day. Did any of y'all see a chariot of fire pulled by horses of fire on your way to church today? It'd be hard not to look at one. We'd be taking pictures with our cell phones. And if we're bold enough, we'd jump out the car and try to get a selfie. All right. Yeah. But you see, Elisha could not concentrate his gaze upon that chariot of fire and those horses of fire because the same time that they appeared, Elijah went up by a whirlwind. Got news for you today. He didn't go up in that chariot of fire. He didn't go up carried by those horses of fire. He wasn't singing, swing down, sweet chariot, stop and let me ride. No, a chariot was not transportation for Elijah. It was a test for Elisha. And when Elijah, or Elisha, cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof, he was not referring to the thing that separated them, but rather to the one being translated. Elisha saw Elijah as the chariot of Israel. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Elisha saw Elijah as Israel's best defense. He saw Elijah as Israel's greatest weapon. And I think today the greatest weapon is still folk who will hit their knees and pray. Y'all stop talking about Trump and start praying for Trump. No, I'm not a Trump fan, but I pray for him and I'm getting to understand some things about him. He's a very small man. Amen. It is why he has to do what he does because of his insecurity. And you can call him a racist all day long, and you may be right, but there's a couple of them uh -huh. running for the Democratic nomination who are racist as well. I got a text yesterday from Jenny. Who's no. Jenny? <laughs> all I know is she works with Mike Bloomberg's campaign. And she's talking about we need to stop Trump and we need a Democrat who can defeat him. Will you support Michael Bloomberg? I texted back, Mike Bloomberg is a racist. Hashtag stop and frisk. When a man says we are stopping too many white folk and not enough minorities, I have an issue with that. When a man says Ryan, you might have to hit the organ for this one. When a man... No, no, because I just got to... Don't get on the organ, but I might break out to when a man loves a woman, and that's not what happens. When a man says, if you want to stop the violence, go to the minority neighborhoods and start throwing young men up against the wall and frisking them, that's racist. And he can get up all day and say, I'm sorry. You were not sorry when you said it. The sorry you are is a sorrow of attrition, 
not contrition. What do you mean, Pastor? You're not sorry because you said it. You're sorry because we remember that you said it. And if foolish as is your hope, you better hope he doesn't get in because the cops will be rolling just like Mike said. My name is Craig High, and I approve this message. I'd rather see Elizabeth Warren in on. Or Grandpa Bernie. I better stop that. I'm almost as old as Bernie. Let me get back to what I'm saying. Elisha saw Elijah, forgive the tirade, y'all, but I'm full of the, the, today. I got one more tirade in me, um, and it's probably going to come out. Brace yourself. Because I saw something on the internet that made me mad. And I need to stop looking on the internet, probably. That's where I saw Mike Bloomberg talking that junk. But still, our best defense are praying folk. Amen. Praying people are the best defense against whatever the devil is trying to do. I heard Suffering and Bishop Cooper say it uh, Thursday at <laughs> Pastor Brian's home going, it doesn't matter who's in the White House, I'm in the right house. I'm in the right house, y'all. I'm in the house of God. But Elisha saw Elijah as Israel's best defense and their greatest weapon. Elisha, Elijah was the one staving off to further spiritual decline in Israel. He was the one that heartened and encouraged the sons of the prophets. And he was the one who single-handedly proved that Baal, Baal and Asherah were nothing compared to the true and living Yahweh. When they could not answer by fire, Elijah's God did. So when Elijah cried out, he was not saying, Elijah, look at this. He was saying, Elijah, I see you being taken from us, and it's breaking my heart. It's breaking my heart because I don't know what's coming next. This is not a cause for celebration for me. This is a great cause of consternation, and you can see it in what he did. He tore his robe in mourning. And he saw great Israel's greatest hope being taken to the sky in a whirlwind. All right. yes. Now, as I considered what was transpiring at the Jordan, it occurred to me that Elisha wasn't sure what was going to come next. This was major. Not because of what had just happened, but because of what lay ahead. For all Elisha knew at that moment, the God whom Elijah served, the God who took him from earth to glory, may have gone with him. Amen. And just because a coat fell from the sky did not necessarily mean that he got what he asked for. It's not as if the mantle fell on Elisha's shoulders. Bro had to go pick it up. Mm -hmm. And Elisha knew, as I know, a piece of cloth means absolutely nothing. But the presence and power of God mean absolutely everything. And so bereft of his master, with 50 sons of the prophets standing by watching, probably all of them with one eyebrow raised, Elisha took the cloak of Elijah, wrapped it up, 
hit the waters of Jordan and ask, where is Yahweh, God of Elijah? That's a question we need to consider today. I said at the outset of this message that the time of our text is a lot like the times in which we live. Ours is a time of willful and capricious leaders. And religious leaders who are often more concerned about their own comfort and prosperity than they are about people that they are supposed to be serving. I said that Israel of Elijah's time was a spiritually pluralistic society. Whether we realize it or not, ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, we live in a post-Christian society. And as we look at societal norms and the trends that they are taking, that question of Elisha's becomes even more appropriate in our times. Where is Yahweh? God of Elijah. Second tirade, y'all, but I gotta say it. Surfing the internet and I got the picture right here. I found, I don't even know how to phrase this. I know how to phrase it, but intellectually it does not make sense to me. How many parents of young children do we have in this room? Yeah, yeah, preschool or grade school. Watch your children. There is an agenda. I found a transgender baby doll online. Now, I think there's time enough for somebody to make a decision when they grow up about their sexuality. They are not coming out of the womb transgender. This seems to tend toward a gender dysphoria rather than um, a celebration of diversity. Glory. You don't have to say amen. These are the times that we're living in. And when I see things on television, they're not aiming at me because I'm too old. They're not aiming at me. They're aiming at y'all's children and your grandchildren. These are the times that make us wonder where in the world is the God of Elijah. Now before I get back to our text and before I answer that question, I have to ask and answer another question. The question I need to ask is who is the God of Elijah? It is as germane as Elisha's question. In fact, it is more pertinent. If we do not know who he is, where he is becomes irrelevant. Elisha knew who Elijah's God was by his association with Elijah. I got to ask a question. How many people can get to know God by associating with you? Let's get real. You know, no, no. <laughs> One day a week ain't going to get it, y'all. You got to be holy seven days. You got to be straight seven days. What do you mean straight? Morally upright. I ain't trying to throw no stone. You got to be right. Breastplate of righteousness should be worn every day. People ought to be able to see you and discern something different, not by what you wear, but how you carry yourself. I can 
be holy in a pair of jeans and a t-shirt. And so can you. But you can't be holy running back and forth, hither and yon, to and fro. The reason Elisha knew Eli Elijah's God, I knew I was going to mess those two names up because they're too close and I'm too tired. The reason Elisha knew Elijah's God is because Elisha hung out with Elijah for eight years. Saw the man pray. Saw the man practice the presence of God. All you prophets and would-be prophets, if y'all are not practicing the presence of God, then I question whether you got a word from God or you got it on CNN. I'm just putting it out there. What I'm saying is this. Elijah was a man of God 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Woke up a man of God, went to bed a man of God, conducted himself all day long as a man of God. Was Elijah perfect? No. All you have to do is read and you find the bro had some issues. But issues notwithstanding, he was a man of God. And I said that because there's some of us in here with some issues. All y'all who got issues, raise your hands. And my hand is up because I got a couple too. One of my issues is my eccentricity. You know what that means, right? Out of center. <laughs> I'm out of center. But that's okay. I've learned to love my eccentricities and celebrate them. Uh -huh. All I'm saying is Elijah was not perfect, but he was perfect enough for somebody to see God in him. Are you perfect enough for somebody to see God in you? Uh -huh. Y'all ain't liking me right now. I guess I'm on a tear today. <clears throat> but you know, this ain't the place, y'all. This ain't the place. This is where we should come to get filled up. This should be a staging ground for living out there. This ain't the place to come in and confess all the foolishness you did last week. No! This is the place to get some strength so that when you go out there, they can say, that's a woman of God. That's a man of God. No, they ain't preaching to me, but their life is speaking to me. Okay, okay, okay. I, I gotta quit. But just in case you don't know who he is, let me take a moment to introduce the God of Elijah. His name is Yahweh. At least that's the closest we can come to pronouncing it. Four Hebrew consonants that are soft um, does not give you an ability to really pronounce his name. So they borrowed uh, the vowels from Adonai, another name for Lord, through them in between the consonants for Yahweh, uh, for uh, God's name, which I can't pronounce because even if I could, you wouldn't be able to hear it. It's almost like, you know, so they threw them in between those letters and came up with Yahweh. All right. And I guess the Lord saw that as acceptable. It simply means the one who exists. He is the ter eternal is. He lives in the eternal presence. Present. And, that, and, and what I mean by that is God never was and God never will be. He always is. In your past, God is. He's still right there. In your present, God is. In your future, 
God is. But I have to say, I love the way the young adult praise team broke him out for us today, unpacked him today, and said they called him Waymaker. They called him Miracle Worker. They called him Promise Keeper. They called him Light in the Darkness. That was Elijah's God. The one who made a way when the brook at Kerith dried up. That was Elijah's God. The miracle worker who stood with Elijah. That was Elijah's God. The one who always keeps his promises. How many of you know that he's kept his promises to you? That is Elijah's God. The one who shines in the darkness of our souls and gives us light. That is Elijah's God. Now, because he exists of and by himself, he does according to his own prerogative. But Elijah asks, where is Yahweh, Elijah's God? Elijah was not only inquiring where God was, but who God was and how God was. He called Yahweh, Elijah's God. Elohim. Elohim speaks of the God who possesses all power. You see the word Elohim is the plural of El or Eloah which means a powerful God. But when it refers to the true and living God, it is not a plurality of deity. There are not a few gods up there, no. It refers to a superlative of power. What it is saying is the God who is more God than any God you can think of is Elijah's God. The God who can do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think and some on top of that is Elijah's God. The God who can get it done is Elijah's God. The God who can back up a servant of God when he says it's getting too late to fight the enemy. Can you just stop the sun for an hour? The God who tells the sun don't move until they get done is Elijah's God, the God of power and prerogative. He is the God who shut up the heavens at Elijah's command. He is the God who changed the nature of ravens from thieves to nurturers in order to feed Elijah. He is the God that answered by fire when Baal was silent and when Asherah was silent. He is the God behind every miracle that Elijah performed. He is the God that took Elijah into heaven by whirlwind and he is the God who chose Elisha to succeed him. This is the God Elisha inquired of when he took Elijah's mantle, rolled it up, struck the waters of Jordan and asked, where is Yahweh God of Elijah? And immediately upon asking that question, the waters of Jordan rolled back and the scripture said Elisha went over. I wonder if there's anybody here who wants to go over. You're tired of being under. Anybody ready to go over? If you want to go over, you've got to have Elijah's God. Can I preach for a little while here? When those waters rolled back, it was God saying, I'm right here. God was saying as I was with Elijah, I will be with you. And as I saw that, I heard an echo from the past. I remember a fellow by the name of Joshua sitting at the bank of the Jordan River. God telling him, get up, rise and go over this Jordan. Jordan unto the land that I swore unto your fathers to give them. He told him, there shall not any man be able to stand before you all the days 
of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Told Joshua, every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon. I've already done it. Just get up and walk. I've already handled the business. I've already taken care of the deliverance. I've already done the groundwork. I've already fought the battle. All you have to do is put one foot in front of the other and trust me. All you got to do is just walk and claim it as you walk. Praise me as you walk. Bless me as you walk and call it yours. I wish I had a praiser up in here right now. I don't think it was coincidence that at the same Jordan, Elisha now finds himself where Joshua found himself. Joshua at the Jordan was preparing for a new phase for Israel. That mixed multitude that came out of Egypt was about to become a conquering army, poised to take possession of the promised land by force. And then in our text at Jordan, we not only see a translation, but we see a transition. Elisha was preparing to lead the sons of the prophets on a spiritual quest to take back the kingdom of God. But in order to do that, he, like Joshua before him, had to be magnified in the eyes of the prophets and all Israel. God did this by granting Elisha's request, gave him just what he asked for. A little bit earlier, I shared with you the right of primogeniture that many theologians teach that this is what Elisha requested of Elijah. Well, I don't know if that's what Elisha asked for or not, but I do know this. Elijah performed 16 miracles in his lifetime. Elisha performed 32 miracles. Elijah even raised one from the dead during his prophetic ministry. Elisha also raised one from the dead in his lifetime. But there was a time when Israel was under attack and the marauders broke up a funeral. They had to ditch the body quick and so they threw the body in the sepulcher of Elisha. When that dead body hit the dead bones of Elisha, the man stood up. You want to talk about power? Can you imagine the kind of power that lays in the grave with you? I think every saint of God who is baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost has that kind of power because there's coming a time when the trump of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall stand up, leave their caskets, leave their graves, and be caught up. Oh, I wish I had a praise. This ain't no fairy tale. So let's do the tap. I haven't heard anything that the sons of the prophets did. But Elijah performed 16 miracles. Elisha 32. 16 times 2 or 16 doubled is 
32. Elijah raised one. Elijah dead raised one. Elijah alive raised one. One and one is two. And two is twice as many as one. I'm not the brightest bulb in the bunch or the sharpest knife in the drawer. But that show enough looks like a double portion to me. And Elijah needed just that for what he was about to face. But I want to go back to the Jordan for a moment. I said a bit ago that it's interesting that Elisha succeeded Elijah in the same geographic location that Joshua succeeded Moses. Well, it's more than interesting. It is significant. And it is also symbolic. Jordan is symbolic symbolic of transition. Anytime somebody crossed the Jordan, a change was coming in their lives. Jordan signifies a change, a change in condition, a change in status. It is also significant that Elijah's transition occurred in his eighth year of serving Elijah. Eight is a number of transition and a new beginning. I said all of that to say this. Three is also a number of transition. And I'm trying to bring it back to our times now. It is a number of completion and beginning. And here we are at the cusp of the third decade of the new millennium. I'm trying to tell Bethesda we are at a place of transition. Our times are transitional times. Our circumstances are in transition. Our conditions are in transition. And if ever there was a time that that question was appropriate, now is the time. Where is the God of Elijah? This is the God we need in these times. We need a God who will stand by his servants. We need a God who will meet our needs. We need a God who will be with us through bad times as well as good. We need a God who performs miracles. We need a God who works wonders. Where is this God? And the answer is right here. The answer is he is with us. Jesus said if two or three of you would gather in my name, I would show up. He also said, I'll never leave you. I won't forsake you. Solomon said, he'll be with you in six troubles. In the seven, no evil will touch you. And I just came by to tell somebody that the God who was with Elijah is with you. The God who was with Moses in the wilderness. The God who was with Joshua in the promised land. The God who was with Elisha in his ongoing ministry. The God who was with the Hebrew boys in the fire and furnace is with you. He's with you to strengthen you. He's with you to help you. He's with you to uphold you. The God of Elijah is with you to bless you. with you to give you the victory. Anybody need some victory? And he will never leave you.
He'll be with you in the best of times. He'll be with you in the worst of times. And no matter how fearful the times, he will be right there. And if you can't seem to find it, if you look like Job, forward and he's not there. You look behind you and he's not there. You look to the right, he's not there. You look to the left where he works and he's not there. You find yourself not knowing where in the world God is in your life. Let me remind you of what David said. David said in the 22nd song, he said, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of thy people. David said, if you cannot find him anywhere else, you can find him in your praise. I dare somebody to look for him in a praise. I dare somebody to search for him in a praise. I dare somebody to grab hold of him in a praise. Last week the praise team said the praises go up and the blesser comes down. Your praise pulls him down. Your praise brings him in. the glory while a hundred folk just look at them I don't need a hundred folk I just need two or three If you just let go. Maybe if you just put a praise on somebody. I know it's tough for you today. Come here. I'm going to free you from that toughness right now. God said, this is the last day you hurt like this. You may not stop ruining, but God said, I'm, for your sake, going to take the hurt away. I'm going to tell you something else.
Come get it, come get it, come! 